Oh, we got a cat. Join us, leave your fear to flower. Join us, leave your cheese to sour. Join us, come and waste an hour or two. We've got magic to do just for you. Welcome to Studio 10 Talks. I am Patrick Cassidy, and I am the artistic director of Studio 10. It is such a pleasure to be here tonight. I am, um, uh, you know, I'm looking at this background. We have this new kind of like we get to create our backgrounds. Our producer has done a fantastic job. And I saw this tonight and I kept wanting to go, there out in the darkness, a fugitive running stars in their multitudes. <laughs> I've never gotten to do that show, Lynn Miz, but maybe tonight. Anyway, welcome all of you. I hope that you guys have all had a great week. Uh, we here at Studio 10 have had a fantastic week too. Um, we got to do our first happy hour on Friday night. It was a special show that we did for all of our donors and our, our, our patrons. And it was a happy hour, the music of Stephen Sondheim. And it was so great getting to sing with all these wonderful artists. We had people in LA that came in and sang and, um, and people here in Tennessee. It was wonderfully so well received. You know, since I've been here in Tennessee and been quarantined for at least half of the stay, about four months I've been here, uh, people have asked me, you know, what, what brought me here. And, um, and I have to say, um, our son, both my wife and, and my son, Jack Cassidy, got a record deal and a publishing deal here. He is a, is an artist. And, and I drove him out here across country uh, last June. And I had never been to Tennessee. And I drove him out here. And, he, um, and I was here two days. And I went, oh, my gosh. I love Tennessee. I mean, it, it was glorious. So beautiful. And I was here a couple days. And then... Um, and then my wife came out to get our son sort of acclimated and, and, and um, she said the same thing. She called me from the frothy monkey and she said, honey, I could live here. And that, boom, that set me off. I said, yes, but what's the theater like? And that's how I came about Studio 10. And um, so far it has been a dream. Uh, I, I have... Uh, I've become a, a, a talk show host. <laughs> no, it is great to be here. It is great to be a part of Studio 10. And, um, and I am truly grateful, truly grateful. We have an incredible show for you tonight. I'm so excited about this guest. She is a, um, a longtime friend. We did uh, a Stephen Sondheim show together, a little night music for ACT in San Francisco. But she has an incredible resume. Um, Emily Skinner uh, was last seen on Broadway in the Share Show, and we'll talk about that. But she, she has, she's had uh, two Tony Tom nominations. She did The Prince of Broadway with with director uh, Harold Prince. She did Billy Elliot on Broadway. She was a Tony nomination and Drama League Award for her performance as Daisy Hilton in the Broadway, the original Broadway show Side Show. Uh, she did on Broadway, Jekyll and Hyde. She did J James Joyce, The Dead. She did The Full Monty on Broadway. I saw her in that. She was extraordinary. Dinner and Eight, an Outer Critics Circle nomination. She's on the Actor Fund production of Best Little Whorehouse in Texas and Dream Girl. She was in Dream Girls. I want to know what dream she played in that. And she has sang at Carnegie Hall, multiple sym symphonies. Ladies and gentlemen, with such respect, I would like to introduce you to Miss Emily Skinner. <laughs> Hi. That's did a great you, introduction. Boy. Did you like that? Could I, I did. Could I become your agent? <laughs> please. Please. I need that. My God. How are you, my dear? I'm good. I'm good. I'm coming to you straight from Manhattan. Wow. Straight from Manhattan. Well, I, I want to talk about that because you are the, this is our fourth installment of this show and it has been incredibly successful and, and people have been so excited by it and, and to get to know the people that have done it. Adam Pascal was on it and Susan Egan, mm -hmm. but, uh, but nobody that has been in Manhattan, nobody, I mean, or is currently in Manhattan uh, as, mm -hmm. as you are. And, um, and that's one of, one of the things I, I want to talk about with you is, is what the state of New York is because, you know, across the country, for example, here in Tennessee, yes, 
we have gotten to experience it. Yes, we might know somebody that has had COVID or or we've seen, obviously, and I, and I go out with a mask. I was just out with a mask a little while ago, but nobody has experienced this virus and as the epicenter of New York and Manhattan and people living there like yourself. So tell me, tell us what that has been like. Well, um, I guess I'll go back sort of to the earlier part of March. Uh, at the beginning of March, I was in rehearsal for a, a, a new musical called Once Upon a Time, One More Time. Uh, and it was um, slated to go to Chicago and then we were going to have the summer off and then we were going to go to move to Broadway in the fall. But we've been rehearsing for two weeks. Was this the Britney? I'm sorry. Was this the Britney Spears musical? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Well, yes, we'll, we'll drop that name another time. Using okay. Britney Spears. <laughs> That's about the um, and uh, so and, and COVID-19 had been, you know, in the news a lot. Uh, but then um, they started in New York, they started having uh, cases um found in the theaters mm. uh, and on March 12th, Thursday, March 12th, they shut down Broadway, which is an unprecedented act. Yeah. Broadway has, I think maybe Broadway was shut down once during the war briefly, right? but never like this. We have been shut down since March 12th. Um, and on March 13th, we all came to rehearsal and, and we were informed that Chicago has shut down as well, obviously, all the theaters in Chicago. And so our, our, our production was completely canceled. Mm. Um, but it is, it is a strange thing here in New York. Um, I live up in Harlem and I live five blocks from the Harlem Hospital. And uh, the first um, couple of weeks of, of this, uh, I just heard nonstop sirens and ambulances 24 hours a day. Um, so I didn't sleep at all because it was nonstop. Wow. Stuff. It's 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 week by week. It's it's gotten a little less and a little less, which is which is good. Um, thank God I've got triple pane glass windows. Mm. <laughs> you can see, um, but it's uh, it's really quite serious, and I worry that the rest of the country isn't taking this seriously because it's not affecting them in an immediate way. Absolutely, the way it has New York City. Yeah, um, I mean they. We I mean we see the numbers, and I see the numbers yeah. today because. You know, I have so many friends like yourself. But, you know, you can you can see numbers and you can see stuff on a, a TV. And unless it's affecting you directly, unless you're seeing it directly in front of your face, it's hard for us as humans, I think, to get a get a grip on, oh, this is a real thing affecting Completely. Me, uh, completely. Know, affecting I, I have, world. you know, I, I had spoken to some several friends of mine about, um, you know, because New York was my second home. I, I, I literally, I, I was born in California, but New York was my second home. And I remember I was not in New York when 9-11 hit. And I was so angry about it because so many of my friends, I felt like I needed to be there. I was supposed to be there. And yeah. I was actually in Arizona. And the same holds true with this a little bit because so many of my friends like yourself are there experiencing this and going through what is truly traumatizing. Traumatizing. And, and yeah, I was I was around for for 11 too um, here in New York. To me, the the similarity is that we're all having a mass consciousness right now. Mm -hmm. All of us around the globe. It's not just New York. I mean, the the world is experiencing this. Right. Um, and it was one thing in in New York. I, I think more so than any time I had lived there before. When 9/11 hit, we experienced as a city a mass consciousness of we just wanted to help. In the immediate aftermath, we we went down there, mm -hmm. we went to blood banks, we did everything we possibly could to help help. This is a has been a weird situation because we were basically all told to go home, just go home and stay there and stay go away from anywhere, stay don't completely go anywhere. Away from each other. Yeah, yeah. So we have basically all been on lockdown in our various apartments and homes in New York City since since uh, I think March seventeenth was the was the official date, March sixteenth, um, which is which is really really intense, really intense and thing because you feel you feel um, um, in, in when something when a crisis hits, you want to help. Mm -hmm. And being told the way to help is to just sit home is, right. is sort of like, <laughs> and for, you feel and, sort of helpless. You know? And for you, um, you are, you live, do you, you live by yourself, right? I so do, you, yeah. So you, so, and you have, you not had any 
socializing at all other well, than thank this. god for for facebook facetime and right. zoom and i have a regularly scheduled um facetime dates and, and zoom mm -hmm. dates with friends every day thank god and after the first couple of weeks i realized i cannot stay in my apartment all the time or i will lose my mind so i started to do socially distance walks well that's the first time emily the first time that you and i spoke when i asked you to do this <laughs> that's right i called you and, and you are and you facetime you were on the street with a mask that's right you were talking on your walk through <laughs> with my mask, yes. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um so the, most new yorkers just sort of keep their sanity you know go out once a day to you know, take their socially distance walk six feet apart with masks and everything. Um, have you done, have you done it? You know, you know, Stokes, Brian Stokes Mitchell, who actually had COVID and, and, yeah. has, and has recovered and it's totally fine. But, you know, he was so, I guess, touched by all the attention and people really, you know, praying for him. And uh, that when he got well, he was, he went outside in his apartment, apparently was singing the impossible. Right. Dream. Right. Have you done yeah. anything like that? Have you been singing? Out <laughs> Well, he was doing it for a while, and then I understood he stopped because it was drawing too much of a crowd. Yes, exactly. They weren't practicing were social distancing. Enough, so he stopped doing it. It's a understood. nice theory. Um, but uh, there's a wonderful thing that happens at 7 o'clock every night um, here in New York, whereas everybody goes out um, out their front stoop or out their window, and we all clap and cheer for, for a couple of minutes for the essential workers and the, right. and the hospital workers. And, and They've everybody. shown that a lot on the news. It's, yeah. it, is so it happens. It happens every day, and um, it, uh, it's grown and grown more as the weeks have gone on, and it's, it's, it's one moment every day I get very choked up. Well, yeah, yeah, I, yeah we, and, and that is something that has affected us here too. It's beautiful to watch. Um, yeah. Well, let's, let, let me go back because I want to talk, I'll talk about Broadway, but I want to talk about you on Broadway. I want to talk about all, all the things that you've done because <laughs> as well as being a friend, and I say this all the time, uh, I'm such a fan. Like, even though we've gotten to work together and stuff, I'm still I know, stop saying that. We've worked together so much. You can't stop I know, but I'm fan. still a fan. You're not and that's, a fan that's, boy. That's, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. And <laughs> tell me about, you know, and I, it's fun, It's funny because I've, I've asked you a little bit, but usually we just talk, we're just friends and stuff, but I haven't gotten to ask you, ask you over the years a lot about your career. Tell me about, you got your start in Christmas Carol, Alan Menken's Christmas Carol on Broadway. Yeah, that was the first, um, I, I'd done some off-Broadway things. I moved here in 92 and I'd done a couple of off-Broadway shows, a couple of workshops, but my first sort of big thing I did in New York was I got cast in the original cast of A Christmas Carol mm. that they did at Madison Square Gardens that was written by Alan Menken and um, Stephen Flaherty and Lynn Ahrens. Um, and so oh, yeah. I, I did that and that was sort of my first sort of big New York show. Uh, and then I did Jekyll and Hyde, the musical of that. Oh my um, gosh, who are you in that? I was in the ensemble for that. Oh, you were, and I, and I covered the two leading ladies. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And that was was that with is it Guccioli? Did he play? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. About Guccioli. Do you know? I'll tell you a quick little thing, a little anecdote about that. Terry Mann did, a, I guess, a workshop of that before it came to Broadway. I, I was in that workshop. Oh, yes. you were in that. Yes. Terry wonderful. told me the greatest story. Uh, about how he got that job. He said he went into the audition and he brought a can of Coca-Cola. It's a Coca-Cola can. And I he, like the story already. He took the Coca-Cola can and he put it on the casting table where all the directors and everybody, and he put the can there, right? Uh, and then he started, you know, this is the moment. This is the time. And right as he started saying, and, as the, and it was all directed at the Coca-Cola can. And he ended the song, it crescendos, and it, it okay. it, and he gets to the thing, and he gets to the can, and he grams. He's obsessed about this can, and he ends it with going. <laughs> <laughs> it was, and they were so blown away by it. They were because you know he's such a good actor, and he, but they loved his choice of using a coke. And they said we should use it as an ad. It's a perfect. Uh, yes, a I think so. I think so. <laughs> but, yeah. but yes. So so Jekyll, Jekyll and Hyde. One one quick little question I wanted to ask was, did you? Where did you go to college? Where did you go to school? Oh, I went to school at Carnegie Mellon in yeah, Pittsburgh. What, yeah, I had yeah. I had to say that. I knew that, but I just had to say. Yeah, how did you know that? My gosh. You 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 and I talked. Oh, is this a question I have? Oh, is this a question from Natalie? Hi, Natalie. Hi, Natalie. Do you know Natalie? 
Okay. So you want to, my favorite quote during all of this <clears throat> is that science will save us, but art will get us through this. My question for Patrick and Emily is what have you been watching, reading, performing to satisfy those artistic cravings? Oh gosh. You know what, Natalie, this is, this is a like personal conversation between you and I too. Uh, but one of the things that I've started to do is I've started to work on my meditation practice. <laughs> Um, just because I feel like if now, if, if not now, when, when, right. <laughs> if not now, when, um, if for, not only for my sort of mental health, but for my, my just foster more of a sense of spirituality mm -hmm. within myself. And this whole thing of us being sort of in, in isolation here in New York, um, and also sort of us living with this low grade grief because of the people who've gotten sick and the people who have died because of this, um, the meditation thing, I really feel like um, it, it's it's helping grounding me. It's grounding me every single day doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it once a day. I'm trying to ratchet up to doing it twice a day. Mm -hmm. um, good. But uh, I recommend everybody, now's a good time to do it. We're all in this moment. We're all sort of been left with, we can't do any of the things that bring us comfort here in lockdown. We can't. Right. We can't join with family, can't join with friends and such. We can't, we can't go to work. We can't go to the gym. We can't do the things that sort of, you know, keep us whatever. Ground, grounded. Um, so and, all we're all we're kind of left with is ourselves. So and I agree with I get, agree with you hundred percent. Get really comfortable with yourself. I, I yeah. and I agree with you hundred percent about the meditation thing. Melissa, my yeah. wife, she has gotten heavily into meditation, and it has helped hmm. her tremendously. And um, and you know that what you were saying, it's that we it's we're totally out of our comfort zones. So we're having Very to much. invent and create and figure out other methods for us yep. to feel comfortable in, yep. in in a zone where we're not, you know. Yep. Um, so um, and of course, the artistic part of it, at least for me, in, in answer is, is that is this we've I've, we've come across this whole new virtual way of of communicating and creatively putting stuff out there. And that has been really inspirational um, for me as, 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 a, as an artist, but also I think for our community, because they've really gotten on the, uh, on the road of like, oh, we, wanted, we wanted to be a part of the musical theater contest. We want to yeah. sign up for a class. It's really been great. We have another question. Go ahead, um, you read that one. Do you have that one? This is from Danielle. Uh, as a nurse right now in Tennessee, things are really uncertain. I'm missing my theater family like crazy, but I know we have to be so conscientious, so conscious right now. Yes, 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 yes. 100%. Yay for you being a nurse. And we thank you. you. We need and you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you for tuning in because because I, you know, I keep thinking I'm, I'm wondering if the first responders could hold a virtual show because I'd like to tune in and then and do do this. Yeah. For them, you know. That's right. They're, That's they're incredible. Right. I want to I want to get to your the your your big first huge sort of Broadway thing too. And before I even ask that, you, were you in the original Dream Girls? No, we did. The Actors Fund used to do these sort of massive, sort of all-star concerts. Oh, oh that's- Not so much in the last couple of years, but they used to do these. And so I did a, I did one of those for Dream Girls. Oh, you, did you- And I did one together did, where they had, there were two white girls. In oh the yeah, they're, 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 they're the- they played the two, the two white girls. Yes, yeah, they, they, they yeah. Singing, they the, they do the that song. they do that got me a Cadillac 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 right. yeah. the, what, the Lawrence Welk version of yeah the, yes it's, it's they're great yes, yes. so you did you do the one with with Lily Swite and Heather Headley yeah. and Audra and all that yeah it was great it was yeah, awesome yeah. it was a wonderful so, wonderful version so we're gonna show a clip of you okay are we okay. ready for that clip. Right. We, we're going to show a clip of you. Um, I'm going to drink my lemonade while you from from <laughs> from the Tony Awards when you did Sideshow with Alice Ripley. Do you want to set this this song up? I know it, it was also your first Tony nomination. Was that it? Yeah. For this yeah. show, um, set up. I so I love Sideshow, but set up this clip from the Tony Awards. Uh. What can I, how can I set this up? Um, first of all, the show had been closed for five months <laughs> beforehand. So we weren't even open wow. at this point. And when we put these costumes on again, it was the first time we'd worn them in five months. Oh, so we, wow. we, had, we had a very surreal day. That was a very surreal day. I'd <laughs> say and sing the song that we hadn't sung for 
five months. And oh my God. We were very, we were very honored and moved to be there because there was no reason for us to be there. There was no political gain to be had by nominating two actresses in the show that is, isn't running anymore. You mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. So we were, we were very mad. We felt, we felt very small on that ginormous radio city stage. And for the, um, and for the, and for the very few people, I'm sure everybody knows sideshow is about the two, Sideshow is about two real life Siamese twins, Daisy and Violet Hilton, who who were vaudeville stars. Right. Yeah. And and this song is that you will stay together with her, right? Yes. This was the final, final song that they did together in this in our production. Yeah. Here we go. From Sideshow. <laughs> And, mm. and there was something in his book where on Superman, I think my father thought he was as big as he thought he was <laughs> and had put him in his place and said, let, let's, let me tell you who's directing this show, Jack. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> right. but um, yes, I, I would have, I would have done anything to work with him because he was brilliant. Tell me about the experience of the, uh, the Prince of Broadway. Well, that was a very interesting uh, experience because I got a, I got a call from him when I was doing Billy Elliot. In 2011, I got a phone call from him out of the blue, um, saying, "I have, I've, I've got this show, I'm conceiving this show, and I want you to be in it." Like, didn't even tell me what I was doing. Just said, <laughs> I want you to be in it, and I was like, "Okay, great. Who gets a phone call like that? <laughs> job offer from Hal Prince, fantastic." Um, and then I didn't hear anything, um, and every every like six months or so, I would get sort of like an update from him about like mm-hmm. what was happening. We were gonna do. We were doing this reading, or we were doing this um, showcase of it, or whatever. And so it, it, we sort of developed it over the course of time. And he he was started sort of developing it around the people he wanted to work with. Mm-hmm. You know, um, like he at like one point I know Linda Lavin was going to be in it, Richard Kind was going to be in it, and um, they, he sort of it sort of kept changing over the course of over course of time. And uh, it was a retrospective of his career. Basically. Wow! So well, it was back to back to back, no, not numbers from from all of the different musicals that he had he had worked on. Um, did they do with just they, little bits, little bits did, of book to string it, string it along? String, yeah. To keep, did they yeah. did they do anything from uh, It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's Superman? Yes. Well, possibility. Got, possibility. Yeah. possibility. Yeah. yeah. Very very well, cute. Number it made Linda Stroman, Lava. Susan Stroman choreographed yeah. phenomenally. Oh, really? So, oh, so they didn't recreate the original stuff from Evita or Phantom or anything? Um, I mean, they didn't, they didn't, you know, to a, to a T, recreate to a T. But the right, material right. is what the material is. You can only right. sort of do it a certain way. You know? Right, right. Um, yeah, she really made that sort of a, 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 quite a sort of athletic dance number. Oh, I bet. For, for for Janet, who was who was singing that number, and I kept thinking, God, Janet, how are you doing this? <laughs> I could do that standing still, but you know. Woo. But what a what a gift! What a gift to work with him, and that was the last show he ultimately ended up directing, right? Yeah, I know he wow. had been working on two other shows that he had he had told me about, because um, he he was that person who always got to have a project. Mm-hmm. Always yep. as soon as as soon as the show closes, like the opens, the next day he's working on his next thing. Amazing, and that was and he, how he learned to be. I think from George Abbott. Yep, that's George exactly Abbott right. taught him, and he did that, that for sixty years, sixty-five yeah. years. I mean, yeah. just yeah, and inc- the the most amazing career ever, ever. Um, uh, so t- let's let's you and I talk about just from it about uh, our experience on a little night music together. Yes, let's. so um, I so I finally get to work. This fan finally gets to work with Emily Skinner, and you. You were so kind to me during that whole thing because I used to walk both you and Karen Ziemba home at night from the theater because, you know, uh, San Francisco can get a little dodgy at night in the theater yes. district, you know. Yes, right. Um, and and, I, and I, I remember, you know, just with both of you because Karen played Desiree and you were Charlotte and, and you, you were just so – you were so great with me uh, about, you know, just – I just was – I felt like I was, you know, just – in awe, in awe of, of both of you. And, 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 um, and you were great. And, and during the course of the show, I mean, your performance, you had never done that role before. It was your first time. 
I had done that role before. I had oh. actually done the show three times before. Hmm. If um, I had done no, my twice own before. Work, I this is my third question. <laughs> I played I played um, uh, uh, the maid. Oh right! Oh, you played Petra. First production, and then I did um, an earlier production of where I played Charlotte. But this was such a different um, production, and Mark Lamus directed it, and really sort of, really sort of redirected me. So I wasn't I wasn't at all giving the same performance that I had been giving the first time or the yeah. second. Yeah, right. Yeah, it was such a different production. Mm -hmm. you know? So it was. I was great. I, I was pretty mediocre in the show, wasn't I? Yeah. Well, except you. You were you were pretty mediocre. <laughs> you were fantastic. What are you talking I about? wanted to play. I I wanted to play the maid, and Mark Lamos said no. <laughs> no, we're going to put you as Frederick. <laughs> I loved it though, and you know they were going to. One of the few people I know who can sing that. Oh uh, yeah. Well, That's it's a... it. It took me. You know, they say that learning trouble in River City is hard. Try learning now as the sweet imbecilities tumble so lavishly onto her lap. Yes. That right. just that one line, you know. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's hard. It took it takes a lot of work, but what a joy. Um, and also, tell I wanted to know about because we also have another composer that we share in common. You did Billy Elliot, and I did Aida, Mr. Elton John. Now, right. how much was because I, I it's funny I talked about this with Adam Pascal because he was the original Rod Amaze and Aida, and I did the first national tour, and we both talked about how much or how little experience we actually had with Sir Elton himself. Did you have any play with Elton? Was he there? Was no, I mean, he show, I mean, sh showed up on, on opening and, you know, kissed everyone and hugged everyone. It was sort of like, <laughs> <That was it. laughs> you know, yeah. What I've been told about him was that he very much sort of wrote this, wrote, you know, wrote the scores and was like, see an opening. You know, there, right. was, there wasn't a lot of sort of tweaking and rewriting and, and stuff. And they sort of they sort of developed the shows around the scores. That's exactly yeah. that's but exactly that guy has some good scores. Oh, yeah. And, and that's exactly what stuff. Adam said, too. Adam yeah. said he wasn't because it's a big deal. It's like an ordeal when Elton comes, you know. <laughs> It's, you know, there's such an entourage of people that follow him and are with him. And then, so it's, you know, and it, and then, as he said, it becomes about it's not about the run through or the it becomes about it's the Elton show. Elton's there, you know, so you're, you know, you know what? It's uh, maybe Billy was a little bit different because there were so many children involved. But oh. my memory of him was he was really, really nice to the kids. Oh, that's like, awesome. really overwhelmingly kind and wanted to talk to every single one and take pictures of every single one. And mm -hmm. I thought you're a good you're not Ishmo because you like these kids and you're into these kids and they're into you. So maybe made, made me like him a lot. Now and now, tell me about because I've heard so I want to. I need confirmation on this. And then next week, you know, Jason Daniel is coming on the show, and I know Yay. you guys did did Full Monty together. We did. We sure did. So, so, tell me the truth, the story about the night that the the the, the blinding sort of strobe, I guess, effect or the blinding <laughs> light didn't happen. And and just so and I can let me see if I'll try to set this up for the audience. So at the end of the show, when the when the guys are doing their big strip, and uh -huh. they do the whole thing down to the G string, and they put the hat yes. in front in, in front of them, and, and then there's a mo moment where they actually take the G string off and they do the reveal, and then there's this blinding light that hits the audience. Right. So, so you they don't, don't actually, they don't actually see, see. But yes. one night, this light failed to work. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Or I know in tech it would like <laughs> it would, it happen like a couple of beats too late or too soon or. You know. uh, yeah. Um, yeah. We also we also by the end of that run we also a lot more of the guys than we ever needed to. Oh really? See. Really? <laughs> Thank God we we all really love each other. Oh uh, um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I think also by that time, you know, by the time they had they had they sure. they sort of. And Sherry Mitchell sort of said, you got to get used to this. So they were rehearsing in those G-strings. Do you know what I mean? Like in rehearsal, they were like, it wasn't like, oh, we're going to do this the first time in front of an audience. They they got used to, to, to doing that and being that like early on. Right. Um, have you ever done that show? It's a good show for you. Uh, yeah, back in my Joseph days where I wore a lot of tanning cream no, and I was in could, great shape. Be, 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 well, actually, in that show. How I'm, 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 well I'm, I'm probably more right for now because I've completely let myself go. Uh, 
<laughs> but yeah, it would be it would be fun. It's it's one it's of the a shows. Great show. It's, it's one of the shows I actually want, I want to produce here. Yeah, no, it's yeah, one. It's, it's, a, it's a good, good, good crowd pleasing show. You know. I think we have some questions. Yes, here we are. Oh my God, this is a good friend of mine, Mr. Stephen Karish. You were brilliant on Sideshow. Was that your most challenging character to date? Ooh. Uh, no, I don't think so. Really? Um, what was challenging about uh, Sideshow was the stamina to do it eight times a week vocally. That was what was really I bet. challenging because it was very, very rangy and all over the place. and. Norm Lewis and I, I think of, of all five of us, me and Alice and Jeff McCarthy and Hugh Pinaro and um, Norm were, were sort of the principals in that show. And, and Norm and I, whoo, we were, we were like, we don't know if we can do this all along. You just <laughs> named we... five of like the greatest singers in New York. Just five <laughs> of them. I mean, I know, Jeff, you know why I know Jeff McCarthy? Jeff McCarthy was Kevin Klein's understudy in the That's Pirates right. of Penzance. I was right. 18 when I met him. That's I mean, right. you're, what a singer, what an actor. And of course, Norm, yes. Norm's going to do our show. From Daniel Threat, again, my question is for Emily, what is one of your most memorable moments in your career? Memorable moments in my career? I've had so many. It wasn't God, working I've with had me. So <laughs> working with you would be number one. Uh. Of course, please. <laughs> I mean, God, I've I, yeah, memorable moments. Jeez, where do I start? Um, I, uh, you know, last year working with, with Cher was fairly memorable. You know, okay. I was. We just had a Mother's Day, and last year she sent me flowers for Mother's Day. Cher did. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, because I was playing her mom. Uh, and I thought. You know, my. God, I'll tell you. So I'll tell you quickly. My my wife Melissa is a dancer. Was a dancer for years and years and years. She did the share tour and Melissa has That's natural right. sort of this. black curly hair, you know, and I, and share, I don't know if it's natural, uh, but cause I know she's known for her wigs, but anyway, during the course of the tour, she said to my wife, she says, how do you get your hair like that? That you have beautiful <laughs> hair. <laughs> and uh, yeah. anyway, but yeah, so, uh, but although she never got flowers, I don't think so. Good, good no, she, Melissa wasn't playing her mom. That's right. That's true. You know. <laughs> um, do we have any more questions today? Yes? No? Uh, let's see from Daniel. For Emily and Patrick, what are your favorite roles that you each have played? Um, what is it? Well, I, 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 Harold Hill, I think, is the, I've said this before. Harold Hill is the quintessential part that every Gentile should play, and Tevia is the quintessential part that every Jewish man should play. <laughs> they are the best parts in the theater for, and they are the parts that are the most demanding, I think. And uh, they sure are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Word Wordwise alone. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And what about for you? How many times have you played that role now? I mean, five. you must have done it a lot. Yeah, I've done it five, and I've directed it once, and I produced wow. it, and of course, I was conceived on it that's a, a it's sort of theater that's right that's right you're conceived on it mm -hmm. yeah oh my, God. It is yeah, literally your my mom i think my mother's watching tonight she i said i told her that you were on and you remember oh. you met her up in san francisco right her, yes, her father? yes i love meeting her um uh let me see what else i wanted to talk to you about um what uh in well, I want to talk about actually going back, going back to Broadway and, and where we think and where you think and um, Broadway is going to go. And, and where, what, I mean, I, it's Ooh, funny. I, Patrick, yeah. I mean, I feel like all bets are off at the moment. I agree. Um, I think it's going to, I think this pandemic is going to change a lot of things. Going to change yeah. a lot of things. Um, maybe, potentially, we will get back we will have to get back to the roots of theater, theater. Um, more theater that is done on a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. That's done in a more sort of rough magic way rather than, you know, massive casts and massive spectacle sets and, you know, um, for, for production reasons, because they're going to have to find a financial model for Broadway to come back with um, that's going to involve less people, mm -hmm. um, less people, not only, together but in in the audience together mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so they're they're gonna have to figure out ways to do shows on a, on a 
less for less money, which I, I think forces people to be more creative. Absolutely. Think, yeah. You know? And maybe that's a maybe that's a good thing. That's the kind of theater I love seeing. I love seeing rough magic theater. I you know? I could, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, you know, I've said during this whole pandemic, I've said, you know, obviously two huge doors were closed, but with every every door that closes, windows open, and the windows I think that that's have opened, true. and the windows that have opened in regards to is that people are thinking so far out the box creatively. And they will do, and I mean, I'm, we're doing it here at Studio 10. We're thinking about, okay, for our first show back, yes, we're going to take all the safety measures, but what are we going to do that's going to be creatively satisfying to an audience that still practices those safe measures? You know, not just for the audience, yeah. but obviously for the cast and crew as well. And also um, that is inspiring in this moment. So, you know what I mean? What is, like now I feel like this particular moment, I saw this, this great show great show on Broadway right before Broadway shut down that I hope comes back. I hope they bring it back. It was a, um, a show called The Girl from North Country that had been oh. at the public. They had done it at the UK and they did it at the public and they moved it to Broadway. And it's it's a original, it's an original story about people who live in a, a boarding house in, uh, I think, Duluth, Minnesota hmm. um, in the 1930s. Uh, but they're using the canon of all Bob Dylan music. Oh my gosh. Oh. Which sounds like I, I no, I I'm a big Dylan fan. So I will tell you, it is the it's my favorite musical I've seen since Hamilton. It is it is so profoundly moving and affecting and human. And my father, my father, who like is the all time critic of everything, <laughs> I took my father to see this. And at the end of it, I, I said, "Well, what you think?" And my father was like, "That's the first time I've cried in the theater." Oh wow. You mean none of your performance got him? Oops, a no. <laughs> well, like my when I saw was... my baby on stage at Carnegie Mellon, I was weeping. No, it had no, to be. No. <laughs> um, but that show is about people being courageous in the face of really hard times. Yeah. Be being being brave and, and figuring out that we need other people to get through. We get through with each other. Well, yeah, you know, one of the things that I have constantly sort of compared this to, at least in terms of the fear factor, was that I was in New York City, you know, from 1981 to 1985, before I went back to California at all, right when the AIDS epidemic hit. Mm -hmm. And the fear factor was so, and of course, the uncertainty and the unknown and all of that that was going on. But again, what came out of that epidemic creatively in terms of plays in terms yeah. of movies i got to do an incredible movie was so amazing and i keep thinking where we are now that people are actually writing stuff about what is going on right now right now in yeah. new york right now in the world right now in our yeah. country um and to see w how that turns out creatively you know in the in the years to come yeah yeah you know uh, that, that's a, that's a good inspiring thing to think about because I think oh, you're yeah. right. I think you're right. right. I wish I I wish I had that that writing ability because I know somebody is hold because look we're we're holed up in our places. What else are we yeah. going to do but do yeah. virtual talk shows or write a script? You know. Right. right. <laughs> the other um, thing that I think is going to come out of all of this too is that the it's going to re remind all of us of how much we love live entertainment do you yeah. know what i mean yeah after after having so much we're gonna have a, a long check of time of of doing virtual stuff and thank god for the virtual stuff you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i think people are when this is when this dies down people are going to be clamoring to to commune together in theaters yeah you know? it's it's it is the hugs and it's like look it's the hugs it's the it's the embraces it's the holding hands it's the it's all of that, but it's also getting to, in, there's nothing that's ever going to beat somebody on a stage singing a song or doing a scene and you get to see it live and you get to yeah. watch them go through that. That will yeah. never change. Yeah. That, that will never change. Even I mean, even in this short time that we've been doing this and this format and, and we, you know, we sang and stuff, it doesn't have the same effect. Television or film or, you know, or screens never has. Like yeah. so, it, it will never go yeah. away, and we'll we'll have to make some adjustments. And um, but I I can't wait, I can't wait. I'm sure you feel the same way. Did you? <laughs> I just think this is so funny that you came down. 
you came to Tennessee to do this job and very soon, you know, almost immediately it was your job, your job sort of became a, a multi thing, you know, oh. not just being artistic director, also having to be a, a, a sort of artistic content, <laughs> creative cover up or with, you know? <laughs> And talk to folks. Yeah, it's all of the above, you know. I I kept thinking that I'd sort of you know hung up my tap shoes. I I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd hung up you know. <laughs> I, I get to watch other people really you know just yeah. give birth to great performers and, and get to enjoy them and sit back and and no I all of a sudden my. I've been singing again and, and I've been, you know, trying, <laughs> trying to, trying to be this guy. But no, it, it has been interesting. Um, but I have to tell you, I've made some incredible friends in a very short amount mm. of time here. And this company, Studio 10 is such a tremendous company. The players involved on the board, um, our board chair and his wife are amazing. Our, um, the staff. Oh Studio my God, 10. you got your studio. Yeah, yeah. Studio 10. Look at you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which you now know if you, by accepting the mug, it means that you, you have to now come out here and do a show for us. So that's <laughs> it's just part of the deal. Um, we didn't put that in the little note that accompanied the mug, but now you find on. So, um, but yeah, it's an incredible group uh, of people that have all, you know, been, having to find new ways uh, of improv improvising and, and, and coming together and co putting out creative contact and all of us content and all of us have, have come together and it's a, it's a daily thing. And, and I, like I said, I look forward to my early morning, nine o'clock coffee talk with my managing director every day <laughs> and then the staff <laughs> and then the board and, and then what else are we going to come up with? You know, that's, yeah. that's what it is. Um, yeah. So, uh, I'm going to, I, we, we, we're coming to the end here. I wanted to, um, I wanted, I, I, we closed the kind of the show where we kind of got into this thing a little bit with, I want you to ask me, cause we know each other a long time. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, I want you to ask me any question that you'd like to know the answer to as my friend or just as a, a colleague or what? You know what? Well, all right. This isn't, this isn't that of a who of a, um, question, but I, I am interested, and I think maybe other people would be interested to know too, um, what your experience of working with Stephen Sondheim was. Oh wow! You, you got to work with Stephen on an original show. I've I've worked on, with him on on existing shows. But right. You got to be part of his his gestating period of, of it, brand new it, musical. I, it, uh, well, first of all, if, uh, thank you so much for asking the question because w I told you we did this happy hour with the music of Stephen Sondheim the other night, and it was the one thing I sort of failed to say. <laughs> and, I mean, I, I don't know why I talked. I, I sang a number from Assassins, and I and I talked about the number, but I didn't actually talk about what what you're asking, which is the experience of working with him, yeah. you know, closely and creating something, and it was everything an actor would dream of. I, in, in Assassins, um, there isn't a lot of music. There's only like nine songs, you know, and the balladeer, which is the character that I got to play, sings, I think, four of them. So, and, and he doesn't speak, whereas there's other characters, you know, that just speak and don't sing, but I right. got to sing everything. Right. He's sort of the narrator. Or what, You're the what? Greek chorus. You're yes, the exactly. Greek chorus. exactly. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, I mean, there's so many stories, but uh, what I will say is that Steve is the most compassionate uh, person for actors. He, I would work with him and Paul, the legendary Paul Gemignani and Paul Ford. Paul Gemignani. And we would yes. go over the songs and he would tell me, I remember if I, you know, at one point there was a, it was like, um, I, I, th I think I said they instead of instead of she or, or or whatever, and he literally would tell me why he wrote they. <laughs> he would give me a whole dissertation about this is why the word th the, the word they is in the sentence and not she or he, yeah. and I was like, and I so it was like you you were learning from a master, but at the same time, he was so giving and vulnerable and compassionate and obviously ridiculously smart. I will tell this, this one fun story, which is that in playing the balladeer, I was an American folk singer like Pete Seeger or Woody Guthrie. And, um, and when I get to rehearsal, uh, Sondheim said to me, he says, I want you to learn how to play the banjo. Do you play guitar? No, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a drummer. 
<laughs> so, I'm a drummer. Yeah, that's what I was doing. So he goes, well, you're going to learn to play the banjo. So I sat for six okay. weeks. Six <laughs> weeks. And Michael Starobin, who's amazing in, in his own right, you know, he was our he was our synth player. Well, he's only done the uh -huh. orchestrations for Sunday yes. in the Park and a thousand. Yes. So anyway, he taught me how to play the banjo. Wow. So I learned till my fingers were bleeding how to play the opening of the Ballad of Booth. And it, and I'll never forget, I, I went out there for the first three preview performances and I was like, blank, 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 blank. Johnny Booth was a handsome devil, blank, blank, blank. And I did it. And I did that for three performances. Well, we get to performance right before performance number four and Steve comes backstage and he says to me, Patrick, we're going to cut the banjo. Unless you can go out there and play like Roy Clark, we're just going to put it on your back and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. So were you, were you relieved or were you like, well, I, my, the calluses on my fingers were a little angry, but right, right. I, you put in six weeks hard work. Of, you know. Yeah. But, but he was absolutely a hundred percent right. Yeah. Um, and then I ended up learning that little harmonica part. So I played the harmonica a little bit, but, but the overall thing is, is that every actor's dream is to do or create or originate a song live show. It was the most um, incredible theater experience of my life by far. Yeah. All right, everybody now go on YouTube and watch Patrick Cassidy doing his, doing his song on the Tony Awards for that year for Assassin. Oh, the no, no. There's two things. The Tony, I'll tell you about it. The Tony Awards I did was for Leader of the Pack. And I did. Oh, no. What is, what, but I've seen you do. The, you uh, saw the Carnegie Hall Sondheim thing with Victor. Oh, I Victor that Garvin. Was Tony. Yeah. I've lost my mind. No, but that was, that was that. amazing too. I watched the Carnegie Hall Sondheim celebration. <laughs> Except I look like Michael Bolton. It's a bad, like, muff mullet look. It's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not pretty. Emily Skinner, I, I love you. And I, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Studio 10 thanks you. For, for being a part of this, for sharing your experience in New York and being the gifted person as well as performer that you are. Oh, I'm so glad to talk to you. Everybody, please keep supporting Studio 10. Please, please, please. And wear your masks. Yes. Keep wearing your masks and pay attention to the immunologists and the epidemiologists and the scientists and the researchers. What they're telling you to do, do it. Yeah. You're so, you're so right. I love you. Take care of yourself. I will speak to you so Bye. soon and you will be out here. I guarantee you to do a show. For I me. can't wait. All right. Bye. Oh, you know, I, every, every time at the end of this thing, I'm just like, I'm, I'm flummoxed because the people that I get to, to interview and there are just extraordinarily talented, but extraordinarily, extraordinary people. And Emily is that, um, I hope you guys uh, loved uh, the show tonight. You know, I, I know it flashes across the screen that you can you can support Studio 10 by just clicking on the donate uh, button above and and, and uh, messaging uh, Studio 10 Talks. Um, we survive um, by donations and by ticket sales. And right now we can't sell tickets, but we are going to get there. And this program this show is because we want to connect to you guys out there we want you to know that we're here we want you to know that we're still thinking and creating and putting stuff together for all of y'all so um so take part we're we're here and and we've got so much more great uh people coming on next week jason Danielly who was married, married uh, to Marin Maisie. Uh, he's, uh, he did the original Floyd Collins. He did a uh, full Monty with Emily. He's an incredibly talented guy and he's going to come and talk with us and, uh, and you're going to have a great time when we have so many great guests in the future. Jolie Fisher is going to come and, and Scott Ellis, the director, nine time Tony nominee is going to come. So we got some great people in store. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I, uh, I want you all to stay healthy. I want you all to stay well. And as Emily said, wear your masks. And um, what do I want to say? Oh, we, we always leave with a little song. And um, I was trying to think of a goodbye song. And I thought of Billy Joel. And it's, Good night, my angels. Time to close your eyes and save these questions for another day. Good night, everybody. <laughs>